When sharks bite a human being, their typical behavior is to bite and then release. This is often because they realize that humans aren't their usual prey. However, when sharks are driven by hunger, aggression, and have a high level of predatory intent, it can result in some brutal and catastrophic attacks. Hit that like button and subscribe right now. In today's episode, we go over three times a shark has bitten someone completely in half. Welcome to Final Affliction. Bantry Bay is a bay found in New South Wales, Australia. It is a very isolated area with very little development and instead was turned into Garigal National Park due to its areas of outstanding beauty. With thousands of trails easily accessible to the public, this bay is a very popular hiking spot with access to the water below. One of the most unique aspects of this area is the Aboriginal rock art, which contains about 82 figures depicting people, animals, and daily life. It is an excellent record of the lives of the Aboriginal people and allows people to learn more about a fascinating culture. The 1940s were a particularly tumultuous time in history, mostly due to the ongoing battles during World War II between 1939 and 1945. Throughout the world, people were evacuated from their countries to somewhere considered to be much safer. One such place was Hong Kong, where many British families were situated and, in 1940, were told that they must leave as Hong Kong was becoming too dangerous. 5,000 women and children were evacuated to Australia as a result, specifically relocating the majority to New South Wales. Many families were split up as the men were expected to remain in combat, later becoming prisoners of war. Although thought to be a haven for the newcomers, this was not the case for many of the families when they arrived. It was an incredibly difficult time and meant that those that were evacuated had to adapt to the Australian climate and culture very quickly and without much preparation. One such family was that of Denise Birch, who was 13 at the time of her evacuation. Two years after Denise Rosemary Birch and her family emigrated to New South Wales, they began to feel very settled in their new community. The war was in full force, but they were relatively untouched now, aside from the fear of losing their brother and father who were now Japanese prisoners of war. On a day much like any other, 15-year-old Denise and a group of her friends decided to go to the beach together. It was Boxing Day, and the group had enjoyed spending the holidays together with their families and friends, acclimating to their new surroundings quickly with an Australian welcome. The group ranged in age from 15 to 18 years old, with four boys and four girls. The weather was perfect. It was a sunny day with crystal clear waters that invited them to enter. There had been a few sharks seen nearby, but this was not unusual and they had not heard of an attack for quite some time. They assumed that the area must be safe as there were no warnings posted anywhere to dissuade them. At 9 a.m., they left the shore in two small boats, stopping for lunch at Ironside Point, a small harbor found in Bantry Bay with sparkling rock pools at low tide. While the rest of the group was eating, two of the boys decided that they wanted to go swimming. They paddled away from the shore until they were about 20 meters away and the water was much deeper, allowing them to dive and swim without the risk of hitting any rocks. They were having a great day, enjoying the cool waters and the hot sun, the threat of war seemingly forgotten. Denise was sitting near the shore, trying to cool off and enjoying her lunch with the other girls. They were chatting excitedly about school and their plans after graduation in the next few years. Suddenly, Denise felt a sharp pain in her leg. She looked down and saw to her horror that a large bull shark had grabbed her leg. She screamed out in pain and fear, but was quickly dragged into the water, falling backwards and under the waves. Her friends saw this and panicked, screaming to the two boys in the water that a shark was circling the area. They swam away from the area, knowing that they would likely be next if they stayed in the water while those on shore tried to save their friend. Denise didn't have enough time to grab a breath as she was pulled under the water. 
Although she had been in about two feet of water, the shark had been determined to take her as it dragged her further and further into deeper water where it knew it would be able to finish her off. She knew that if she could just get her legs free of this animal, she stood a chance of escaping with just the injuries on her legs. She struggled against the animal, but it was tightly embedded into her leg with no intention of letting go, knowing that it had its next meal laid out. Suddenly, the shark pulled her deeper underwater, holding her beneath its body to slowly drown her. She could feel that she was running out of air, and began to panic, striking the animal with her fists, but instead of letting her go, it began to shake her by her legs. It ripped further into her limbs, tearing away her skin and muscle from her leg, causing immense agony. She tried to scream, but she was trapped underwater, unable to escape unable to breathe. The friends grabbed rocks and branches from the shoreline and began pelting the shark with them, throwing them with immense force to scare and hurt the animal enough for it to give up. They hadn't seen Denise for some time now, and the ever-growing pool of blood that was on the surface of the water was scaring them. They thought of shouting for someone, but they were the only ones there. The teenagers were alone and fighting a shark for their friend's life. After what felt like a lifetime, their shots hit the shark enough times for it to flee the scene, leaving the group to watch the water for their friend. They hoped that she would struggle to the surface, gasping for air and needing help, but this did not happen. After a painstaking wait, Denise's body floated to the surface, dead. The friends entered the water to check on their friend, but she was already dead. As they pulled her from the water, they were horrified to see the extent of the damage. Her legs were torn apart as she was pale from blood loss, suggesting that this was ultimately her cause of death rather than drowning. They worked together to pull her from the water and quickly rang their parents, begging them to come and help them and that their friend was dead. Denise's family was quickly informed and when her mom arrived at the scene of her daughter's death, she was beside herself. She was inconsolable, cursing the shark and what it had done to her family. Her older sister Pamela was already present, having been with Denise and their friends. She witnessed the whole attack and was in shock, unable to speak to anyone about what she had seen. The police were soon called, although there was nothing that they could do, and they removed Denise's body from the beach. It was determined that the attack was unprovoked as Denise had not seen the shark or antagonized it in any way, therefore ruling her death as an accident. Denise was buried soon after the attack at St. Andrew's Cathedral. It was a large funeral as the community came together to support the family and give their condolences for the freak attack. Her death shocked the public as she was so young and full of life, taken too soon. Her father and brother were not able to attend as they were still prisoners in Japan, but word was sent to inform them of the accident and the death of their family member. It must have been heartbreaking, thinking that you have sent your family away to be safe and out of reach from the bombs, only for your youngest child to be killed by a shark. There was another shark attack in the area soon after on January 4th where a 28-year-old woman named Zyda Stedman was swimming in the shallows. She was attacked and pulled underwater in a similar style to Denise Birch, except Zyda was bitten in two by the animal. When the authorities investigated the attack, they ruled that it was also a bull shark quite possibly the same shark that had killed young Denise. As it had escaped any retribution for her death, it believed it could escape another killing, so it attacked Zyta. The sharks in this area were not previously known to be aggressive, but bull sharks are considered to be the most dangerous sharks to humans due to their natural aggressive tendencies. They know where they stand in the food chain, and so humans are seen as just another prey species to them. Despite efforts from locals and authorities, the shark responsible was never caught and people were simply advised to stay out of the waters of Bantry Bay as they would likely be attacked by the shark where they too would meet their terrifying final affliction. December 19th, 1981. 
the sun decided it was too shy for today as it hid behind the gray clouds looming over California. Many were bothered by the overcast weather. There were not many souls that ventured to the coastlines of the beach-clad state. However, enthusiasts and surfers wanted to take advantage of the storm swell caused by the cold, windy weather. Lewis Archer Boren woke up to his alarm. Although most people would sleep off Saturday mornings, the curly-haired adventure seeker had always been fond of the ocean, and the ocean welcomed him. He planned on surfing the waves of South Moss Beach with a friend, expecting it to be just another typical day. He quickly got up from bed, ate breakfast, and said goodbye to his parents. He got out into the driveway and strapped his 5-foot, 4-inch surfboard on the roof rack of his car. The board was colored yellow and had a black border by the edges. Coupled with the surfer's hands stretched wide while lying on the board, the silhouette from under the ocean eerily looked like a seal. However, this was not in Lewis's mind at the time. He beamed like a child as he maneuvered the car out of the residence, unbeknownst to him, this would be his last goodbye. He drove carefully, reaching South Moss Beach still early in the morning before the rendezvous time. The smell of the ocean permeated the air, promising Lewis another excellent surfing session. Since 1899, there have been six fatal attacks from sharks in California, five of them from great white sharks. Although this pattern would easily send chills down anyone's spine and make them warier of entering the waters, fatal attacks from sharks are not really that frequent. Additionally, surfers know precisely the risk they're putting themselves in while practicing their sport. Unfortunately, Lewis never knew he would be the victim of one such brutal attack. Inhaling the sea breeze, the two friends stood patiently on the coastline, peering across the lonely, turbulent sea of South Moss Beach. The two looked out over the greasy, damp kelp beds underneath the gloomy sky. It floated in large, silent rafts colored brown as though serpents were churning beneath them. The waves were blown out on the reef, scaling up to 15 feet high, driven by the cold winds that day. Not a single soul was riding the waves. How could they not take advantage of this, Lewis and his friend thought. The two men pulled on their wetsuits, laughing and talking, catching up as friends would do. They paced along the coastline for a while, stalking the opportunity and getting a general feel of the atmosphere. Lewis and his friend were experienced anyway and didn't share the fear non-surfers felt. The ocean was their home. The two entered the cold waters and paddled out into the open. Floating on the surface, they sat on their boards, waiting for the perfect opportunity. When the winds favored their request, they lay down on their stomachs, pointing their toes towards the surfboard's tail and paralleled their heads to the stringer. They paddled slowly and then quickly, sighting the incoming waves from their periphery. In almost perfect synchronicity, the two young men placed their hands underneath their shoulders, prepping for the exhilarating moment. As the wave warmly welcomed the two surfers, they pushed against their boards, propping their torsos like cobras, and in one fluid motion, Lewis and his friend jumped to their knees. They took a couple of waves in this position, feeling the balance of the board, something they had done a thousand times already, not realizing a sinister force was brewing underneath the surface. They did this over and over until morning faded into the afternoon. Eventually, it was time to go. Afterward, they returned to the parking area and enjoyed their lunch, talking about surfing, life, and family, and other things that young men in their 20s spoke about. At approximately 2 p.m., Lewis and his friends parted ways, not realizing this was the last time they'd see each other. As Lewis made his way back into the car, he felt an urge in his chest. He dazedly stood beside his car with a half-hearted stance, thinking it would be such a waste to let the beautiful waves go. He bathed in the deserted scenery and decided to hit the waters one more time. Just another short session and then he'd go home. Or so he thought. Lewis made his way back to the beach, pacing along the coastline and trying to get a feel for things once more. This time, he was truly alone. However, it didn't matter to Lewis, the storm swell did not happen every day and he wanted to take advantage of the great waves. He donned his wetsuit and began paddling into the open waters. The sound of the churning ocean filled the air and a dreading atmosphere washed over Lewis. From underneath him, a fearsome creature watched. The great white shark tilted its head, moving a few meters swiftly under Lewis. The 24-year-old paddled and paddled, unwittingly swimming towards his demise. The fish around the area scrambled in fear, making way for the king. 
the shark appeared from the shadows, rearing its formidable head into the light. But Lewis did not see the creature. The gloomy weather ensured anything a few meters below him would stay where they were, in the dark, out of sight, and out of mind. It moved like a submarine, precise, deadly, and cautious. The 400 million years of evolution taught it to become almost invisible in the ocean, following the movements of its prey. The great white shark followed Lewis. Still unknown of the danger, Lewis's fate was sealed at that very moment. Placing itself strategically a few feet below the surfboard, the great white shark suddenly went into gear, propelling 2,000 pounds of brute force towards the surface. The water exploded into chaos. The creature's massive jaws laced with five rows of teeth clamped onto Lewis as he paddled away at the water. It was like a train had struck him. The immense force knocked Lewis back from his surfboard, causing him to sink into the depths of the ocean. The single curious bite removed a portion of Lewis's left chest. Before he knew and understood what was happening, he was already dying. Lewis faded into the depths, instantly succumbing to his injury. The water drew its curtains, hiding the horror underneath it. And just like that, the eerie silence of South Moss Beach swept away the tragic fate of Lewis Archer Boren. December 20th, 1981, the following day. Two surfers were walking along Moss Beach when they discovered a surfboard with a portion missing in the matching section about 15 yards away. The two surfers took these parts and handed them over to Salinas Police Department. Eventually, they passed it on to the supervising ranger at the beach. Monday, December 21st, a missing persons report was filed by one of Lewis's friends over concerns that his vehicle had not been moved from the beach since he was last seen. They feared the worst, and they were asking the same question. Where was Lewis? Their answer was swept by the cold currents on the morning of Thursday, December 22nd. Around 11 a.m., Lewis's remains floated in a small cove approximately one kilometer north of Spanish Bay. After being taken to the Paul Mortuary in Pacific Grove, it was identified as Lewis. An autopsy was done. Severe trauma, left chest, shark bite. Lewis was bitten only once. Subsequent investigations of the bite marks revealed something even more sinister. Based on the segment chopped from the surfboard, a marine biologist concluded that the shark's jaws were 18 inches wide. This indicated the shark's length was more or less 23 feet, weighing two tons. They had no doubt it was a great white shark and the largest ever documented. In all metrics, Lewis was no match. According to experts, sharks do not attack people purposely as they don't consider humans part of their food source. In Lewis's case, it was more likely an exploratory bite, and unfortunately, the behemoth shark was never seen again. Humans have remained on top of the food chain for the longest time. Thanks to their highly sophisticated language, coordination, and innovation, humanity has managed to control the environment to their liking, turning their surroundings into what would benefit the population best. However, we must all remember the ocean is one of the few remaining places we have yet to fully explore and those who aren't careful enough are in for a rude awakening. Whether a shark attacks you because of mistaken identity or out of pure hunger, when a shark attacks, there's a high possibility of you meeting your final affliction. Jurian Bay is a coastal town about 275 kilometers from Perth, located in Western Australia. It is considered to be a family favorite with great swimming opportunities and beautiful crystal clear beaches. It's a popular fishing spot with many species readily available, such as herring and various shark species. Aside from those who enjoy the sport, there's plenty of fresh fish available for those who enjoy eating it without having to catch it first. Amazing restaurants offering hundreds of different styles of cooking. The area is also well known for its Australian sea lions, which are classified as endangered as the population continues to decrease over time. Since Jurian Bay is home to around 21% of the total population of this animal, many people come to visit for a chance to catch a glimpse of them before it's too late. With such a dense population of sea lions in one area, predators are always nearby. The locals know to be careful when entering these waters if they want to make it out alive. 
On August 19, 1967, Robert Bartle and his friend Lee Warner were preparing their dive at Jurian Bay. They were both in their 20s and were very experienced divers and spearfishers who enjoyed being in the ocean as much as possible. Early in the morning that day, the sea was particularly cool with a slight swell that seemed even more inviting. The problem with this swell is that it dragged up a lot of sand and silt from the ocean floor, significantly reducing the visibility underwater. There were already other divers in the water by the time they arrived, and many people were practicing for a spearfishing competition that would take place in the next month. They quickly got ready, changing into black neoprene suits and grabbing their single rubber spear guns, ready to see what they could find under the waves. Unfortunately for them, they would find much more than they bargained for, and only one of them would leave the water that day. Using floats, they were towed out into the deeper waters until they were about 700 meters away from the shore. They could see that the sea floor was barren beneath them until they spotted some limestone ledges which encouraged them to begin their dive. They knew that this environment was favored by large jewfish and were likely to make a decent catch if they went a little deeper. Lee initially remained on the surface to make sure everything was safe while Robert dived down to investigate the area and see if any fish were hiding within the caves. Unfortunately, he couldn't find any signs of the fish, so decided that it would be best to move to another area instead. He began his ascent back to the surface with Lee, but as he was looking upwards, he spotted a large dark figure barreling towards him from the murky water. He stayed still, staring at the figure as it dove down closer and closer towards him from the surface. He was frozen in fear as he slowly realized the size of the creature swimming towards him. He was quickly face to face with a large great white shark, the most aggressive species of shark in the world. It was around 14 feet long and was using its powerful tail to effortlessly close the gap between itself and Robert. Robert had no time to react. As soon as he realized what was approaching him, it was already too late. The shark grabbed Robert between the hip and the shoulder, sinking its teeth deep into his body. The water immediately started turning red as his blood began to dye the ocean around him. He tried to struggle while punching the shark, but he was no match against an 1,800-pound animal. He felt the animal readjust its grip on his body tighter as it began to shake him with immense force, breaking his neck with whiplash in the process. As it shook him, his body began to break apart like a straw toy in the mouth of a dog. The only mercy that Robert was afforded was that he died relatively quickly. Unlike bears who will start eating their prey before they have died, great white sharks will focus on killing their prey first to avoid any further resistance. With one final shake, Robert's body was ripped into two and the shark continued to circle the boat with his upper body still in its mouth, ready to be devoured later. Lee had been watching this attack in horror, seeing his friend brutally attacked and killed in front of him. It was immediately obvious that Robert was dead and there was nothing to be done. But now the shark had spotted him and had begun to circle him about three meters below. Seeing his friend Robert's upper body still in the shark's mouth, he knew that it wouldn't hesitate to kill him and that he now needed to fight for his own life. He looked around for something that he could use to save himself and spotted Robert's spear gun floating near him on the surface. He quickly grabbed it and fired it at the animal, hoping to strike it in the eye to scare it away from him. Despite being an experienced fisherman, the anxiety and terror of the situation proved to be too much and he missed the shot, sending the spear rocketing past the shark's head. The animal was undeterred and continued circling him as it prepared to strike once again. By some miracle, the shark had unexpectedly gotten entangled in the ropes of the floats and the spear gun, triggering the shark to start thrashing in the water trying to free itself. This gave Lee enough time to begin his escape. He hurriedly started swimming back to shore, swimming backwards and keeping the shark in his sights as much as he could to prevent another sneak attack. After an agonizing length of time, Lee reached the surface and pulled himself to shore, finally free from the tirade of the infamous great white shark. Now that he was on shore, he needed to tell someone what had happened. Robert's family had to be told. He ran to Robert's car but was unable to find the keys. 
frustrated, he found keys belonging to another diver who was still in the water and took them, deciding that the diver would understand the circumstances in which his car was taken. He drove to a nearby fishing village 10 kilometers away and quickly found someone who owned a boat and begged them for help. He told Harry Holmes the whole story and everything he had seen. He was horrified by the events. He was the skipper of the Gay Jan and immediately agreed to take Lee back out on the water to try to recover Robert's body, hoping that the shark was still entangled in the ropes as before. As the two men were racing out to the shark, they saw other divers in the water and periodically stopped to get them out of the water, explaining what had happened and how the water was not currently safe. The divers very gratefully got into their boat, thanking them for helping them avoid the same fate that had befallen Robert. By the time they reached the dive point, they had a lot of people in the boat keeping an eye out for the shark. Suddenly, someone spotted it, still trapped in the same ropes that Lee had left it. The scene looked like it could have come from a horror movie, blood and body parts littering the ocean surrounding the shark. They could see that Robert's torso was still in the shark's mouth, but the rest of his body was gone. It had either sank to the seafloor or the shark had already begun to eat his body. The group tried to pull the shark towards the boat to retrieve Robert's body parts, but as they were just within reach, the ropes encasing the shark snapped. The divers quickly pulled back not knowing how the shark would now react. But luckily for them, it swam away from the scene, taking what was left of Robert with it. It's believed that the shark thought that the men were sea lions, as their black hooded suits would have given them the same appearance as the shark's natural prey. When Robert began to struggle while being bitten, he would have mimicked the natural reaction of a captured seal, which only would have triggered the predator response of the shark. It's unlikely that the shark was aware that it was preying on a human instead of a seal, but as the apex predator of the ocean, everything is considered to be a prey animal to the great white shark. People have been advised to wear different colored suits or stay out of the bay when there are high numbers of sharks, but the area continues to attract thousands of visitors every year despite this. A few months after the attack, a monument was erected by Robert's family to commemorate his life and pay tribute to others who died in such a horrific manner. Around the same time, a radio station posted a $500 reward for the experienced fisherman who could take down the shark responsible for Robert's death. One man, Peter Godby, spent 24 hours throwing whale meat into the water in the hopes of glimpsing the shark, but without success. The reward was widely advertised across Western Australia, although no one was able to ever claim the prize and the shark was never found. With an average lifespan of great white shark at 40 to 70 years, it's possible that this shark is still lurking the waters off the coast of Australia to this day, waiting for the perfect opportunity to strike again, sending someone else to meet their terrifying final affliction.